Hi, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce our um, presenter tonight, uh, Dave Dossie. Dave is a described himself as a self self spot um, photographer. He has, I believe, three master's degrees. Did I read that in your bio correctly? There was a and then um, and then um, MBA and then TP or something. No MBB. Okay. And a uh, so, so I, I ran up those, 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 those are for the day jobs. I know that, but I just I was struck by that. I said, Oh, that's quite uh, you know, um, so that's you know, quite destroyed uh, documentation. And he works for the state of Maine, been an, an act, a very active professional photographer for a number of years. He has many of there are many well known um, clients. If you look at his uh bio, that we have um, that are well known in central Maine, they're very familiar names. He's been a contributor to, uh, you know, many main, the several main um, uh, magazines. There actually there was the two that's the thing that stuck out in my mind. Out it was Down East, and then Main um, Houses and Interiors. Is that the Main Home Design? Yeah, Home 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 Design. Okay, which I, you know, have spent a lot of time looking at. I've enjoyed their photography, and so and he's also had, uh, you know, it, many images in the Main Photography Show in uh, Booth Bay. And then um, he did an image, um, I believe this one day was the uh, was a, a, a winning image um, for the May, state of Maine um, photography show um, in 2023. And this gentleman is a uh, cobbler in Augusta. Dick probably, no, you know, but I've, had, you know I've, I've had him work on some uh, got shoes of mine that I didn't quite want to get rid of. Very good. Um, he, um, he's got quite the shop, and, and he, it, it's fascinating how he keeps track of all that stuff, and very skilled. Well, I'm not going to talk anymore, and I'm going to let you guys get, get, get going. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> if you can't hear me, let me know, and I'll try to speak up a little bit more. Um, I just want to sort of preface this by saying, like, uh, you know, I get my inspiration from other people, and so... Uh, it's also very uncomfortable for me to be up here and feel like I'm actually sort of in front of the camera right now. So, um, but what I'd like to do is actually walk through this. Um, I had a presentation I, I did maybe two or three years ago, and I was like, oh, maybe I can recycle that. And, uh, <clears throat> and that wasn't going to work because many of the images were really outdated, and I felt like that, that really wasn't of value. So, um, so I decided I created this new presentation. So first, the first few slides are really are going to talk about my approach to the work. I'm self-taught, um, a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, there, there are people come up to me all the time and say, I, I love your photos. And I said, well, I'm, I'm glad, that I, I'm honored that you love my photos. Um, I'm just glad you haven't seen the bad ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to focus on, like I, my style is, is very much blended, right? So. I think I'm a documentary photographer, but but I I, I approach it with a sort of a photojournalistic um, lens. So I, I'm and I'll get into a little bit more about sort of those styles and how they blend together. Um, I'm also primarily an event photographer. So when I when I talk about my business as a whole, <clears throat> most of my business is actually photographing events. So. The documentary and the photojournalism that I do is all self-driven work. It's all stuff that I seek out and then and then pitch to different publications um, and in hopes that the publications will pick up a story and add some narrative to that. Um, I love to write too, so oftentimes my photographs um, will accompany some text too, which I think is really important. Um, so just to talk about the documentary photography. Um, you know, typically it's a straightforward and accurate representation of uh, people, places, things, and events. Um, use simple and basic techniques to use, like mods are typically very minimal to the photographs. Um, critical to documentary photography, I feel like, is, is really to invoke emotion, um, to have the viewer look at an image and actually be taken there and actually feel sort of what's happening. Um, and most of my own documentary photographer, while sometimes it's planned, often it's very candid and unstaged. The image that you saw on the first screen of the cobbler, <clears throat> I, I know Tom, Tom LaCasse, who, who owns Tom and Shoe Repair. 
And I just reached out to Tom. I said, can I come down and photograph you? And I said, just do your thing. That was not a stage shot. Um, I, I did ask him. I was like, hey, can you hop on and do you have anything you can sew? The phrase of picture is worth a thousand words. Um, it most often aligns with photojournalism because really the goal here is, is to have a small set of images, one to three images. Most critical is timeliness, impact, um, thought-provoking, and current. One of the things that I like pride myself on with my business is timeliness. Um, like I'm never going to go photograph the full moon coming up and post it a week late. <laughs> like I'm just not, I'm not, I'm like, I feel like I want to, I want to get out, I want to photograph the full moon and I'm going to have it up that night. I, I, and you know, I time it right. I'm not going to put it up at 10 o'clock. People will sleep. I'm going to put it up as quick as I can. If I can't get it up at 10 o'clock, I'm going to get it up on social media, probably around seven the next morning. So that when people are getting up and they first open their phone, like that image pops up. So it's really a lot about timing, but keeping things relevant and current, I feel like is super important. As I get into the images, we'll see some ice harvesting and stuff. I'm not gonna photo, I'm not gonna share ice harvesting in the middle of the summer. Um, <laughs> you know, I just feel like the more you can tie an image and make it relevant to the season, to what's happening in the world, the the more impact that image is going to have, um, and the more weight it's going to carry, at least from a photojournalistic and documentary perspective. So I'm just gonna, I don't like to talk about gear too much, but I, it's important because I feel like uh, people want to know sort of what your gear looks like. One of the things that I want to emphasize is that I don't use much of it. <laughs> um, it's funny, I, I, was, I was thinking about bringing a gear back so that I could share with everybody. So I'm like, when I head out <clears throat> with, a, with a plan to photograph, like, what do I take in my but I thought about it, and I'm like, no, that's, that's not going to work. So I keep this bag right here that I brought in with me. I keep it in my car all the time. It's a retired Nikon D70, D750. It's got probably 400,000 photographs on it. And it could die any moment. I have that. I have a 40-year-old Nikon 80-200 push-pull 2.8 lens. Um, I have a Tokina F2.8. 28 to 75 lens, and I have a old Nikon 17 to 35 D lens, which is probably similarly probably 35 years old. A lot of the images I've taken are taken with that stuff. And, and it's just understanding the gear and like the reality of this type of photography is that it doesn't have to be perfect. It's really about capturing the moment versus having a perfect photo. And that's that's what I like about it. My post processing is simple. Like I can, I can get through an event now, and I'll, I'll come home five, six hundred photos. I'll call them down to fifty or sixty. I do a batch edit, very minimal edits up the contrast. You know, play with the shadows a little bit, and that's pretty much it. I put it out. You know, um, the goal for me is to make sure I try to get the light right when I'm photographing. So here's my gear. Um, I haven't, so I have the new mirrorless, the, the, the Z7 II. <clears throat> I got it about three months ago, I didn't even use that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I, I like the old DSLRs, I have the 850, I use that for my editorial work, and then I use an 810 for getting out the elements when I really don't care about the camera too much. Um, it's so old. You know, it's, if something happens to it, it's okay. Um, primarily for all my documentary work, like if I'm outside, 28 to 300 lens. It's, it's a, it's a thousand dollar lens from Nikon. It's basically what I shoot with pretty much. If I'm outside, that's what I'm using. It gives me so much flexibility. And, you know, like it might not be the sharpest lens in the world, but it's pretty darn sharp. And so I use that lens for the most part outside. Um, and, and certainly, as we go through this, if you have any questions about any of the images that I'm going to show, or like what the, what the lighting was like, or what my settings might have been like, I'm happy to answer those. So I'd love for this to be super interactive. I do have a question. Of course, yeah. So when you're inside and doing those shots of a maker or a yep. machine, what kind of lens do you like for that? Um, so so the, 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 the photo I shot of the cobbler was either 
It was either 15 to 30 Tamron 281s. I still like around 1,000, probably 160 in a second. Um, Round the leaderboard, not just. Yeah, that's he, so. So the cobbler was from 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 like the computer away from me. It's a very tight area to, to shoot in where his his machine is, and so I needed to kind of create some some level of compression in there to make it look like I didn't want it to appear to be super wide. So I had to create sort of angles that made it feel somewhat compressed. To like, so I, I feel like, so creativity and perspective, like when we're talking about this type of photography, um, I think it requires a shift really of the, of the direction and perspective. And, and I say that because um, as a self-taught photographer, I've lived a life of trial and error, and I've tried every type of photography really under the sun. And I started out as, I loved macro, I loved landscapes, I loved shooting food, I loved, I, I loved it all, right? But like that's, that's sort of, I think, how kind of everybody starts as they, they kind of touch upon each little area. But like, I love this comparison that I was thinking about, how, how, do, I, how do I explain this one? So like, when I'm photographing a landscape, which I, I do occasionally, and I do it for fun, because like, photographing landscapes is my practice for my documentary work. Like, techniques that I get from shooting landscapes, I can bring it into my documentary work um, and apply them there. But when you're shooting landscapes, like you show up, you have a scene, and the goal is to, to bring that scene alive, right? You find, you know, you've got water flowing through a scene, you want to you slow your shutter down, you want to make some movement in there, you want to bring a scene, up, a scene to life, right? With documentary and photojournalism, like, your scene is already sort of alive. And so your goal is to actually freeze it, then. like, slow it down, stop it. Sometimes you want to have movement. But, but the goal is, is to freeze that moment and capture emotion, capture something that's going to impact the, the, the viewer. Um, and so it's a little different mindset. But you can apply the same techniques from landscape. Like, you want to make, you know, for me, I'm always making sure, you know, things are aligned, right? Rule of thirds, things like that. Things that you would use in landscape photography, like you can, you can apply to documentary work. So a couple of images here, like, this was the uh, solar eclipse in, was it 2000? Craig, you were there. One, one. Yeah, so Craig, Craig, Craig was actually standing next to the rocks with me here. Um, and that's Dean Munga. I don't know if anybody knows his work, but he, he does great work. He's out on the edge of the rock here. And we're sitting there waiting for this, for, for this the solar eclipse to happen. And, uh, and, and the, my style, it's like, geez, I want to capture people. I want, I want to capture these people. And so I just thought it was a cool shot. Like, there really weren't other people trying to capture people. They were waiting for this eclipse to happen. And so I just thought it would, it's a cool perspective on the left. And then, and then the eclipse happened over there, which I thought was really interesting. Somebody reached out to me and said, there's a really creepy face in this cloud in here. Which, um, <laughs> it, it really is creepy. Yeah. Um, there's a, no, there was a... Oh, that was, that was, so that was, I mean, summer, sunrise. I went down to the Alpines like years ago. Uh, I just loved it. And um, so I, I, you know, again, this work is work that I seek out. I try to find unique stuff that's happening across the state in New England. And I go out and I capture it to the best of my ability and I try to tell a story with it. And, um, and then I take these images and I pitch them, right? So I'll pitch them to different publications. A lot of times I put them on my social media and I'll write a story to go along with the images. And people will just reach out and say, can I buy this, can I buy this, can I buy this? Or, you know, uh, we like the wrong uh, So that's sort of how this work ends up in publication, editorials, um, different editorial outlets, um, on the media, a lot of times the news channels will pick up stuff. Um, so. Again, just really trying to tell a story. I don't know if people have any questions about this. I don't know if you've been down to the Everest Scotty Mills, um, but this is super cool. Um, it's a great place to, to really kind of practice to get everything really close together. And there's a lot going on. So if you want to get down there and practice this style, I'll make it down there. Excuse me, Dave? Yeah? Is that one image or is it several images? Oh, this is several images. And yes. just put those together onto one image? Uh, no, I, I, um, uh, so I'll be honest with you. 
I'm not good with technology. This presentation took me about 30 hours to do. <laughs> so, so I have I have about, and I'm not exaggerating. I have about a million photos. I have 150 terabytes of images, and they're not really cataloged catalog well because I shoot so much. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so I have about 20,000 images that I've shot on my phone. So I'm going back through, and I'm literally emailing myself. 13 images at a time, and I'm labeling on this, labeling on that. So, so these are all, these are all uh, me dragging them in, trying to fit them into the slide. Yeah. What's your preferred social media outlet? So, so I use Facebook for the most part. Um, you know, I, I've, I think Instagram's a great tool. Um, Medication. Yeah, but I also like just for some reason don't don't end up there. Facebook just seems to be an easy platform for me to like type a story out of it. And you know, is that because on Facebook, uh, there's a lot of room for text. If you want to add text, then yeah. text tells a story. And you, it seems like you're often telling a story about a situation. Yeah, and Instagram, yeah. you can have text, but really it's just, yeah. and, and, it, and it limits you to a certain number of images, right? So Facebook yeah. now does, right? So Facebook requires you to actually build an album if your image kind of exceeds 75 images, sometimes like I photographed the Iron Man for, like the last two years, and like I had you know 120, 130 images in each of my final albums. So like I was struggling because I can't edit tight a narrative with my album anymore, like and have it showcase the way that I want it to. Uh, so what I wanted to show here though is that this is the Scott Mills, but then I found this other cool location up in Benton. Not a lot of photographs here. But like this was a whole different perspective where these guys are harvesting the allies totally in a different way and i just thought these were really kind of cool perspectives you know I, I was shooting directly down on the top of the dam at the guy filling the boat up by a net that's you know it's got this like big pipe that comes out of the bottom and he's just filling his net filling the boat and then they bring it over and then they unload it it's just super cool so when i'm showing these images like these are very small set of a larger, a large piece of work. So I think this ended up, you know, I probably got, so it's probably about 20 images. The, the one before that was probably 75 or 80. Um, no, Thompson, right? Thompson Ice House. Um, so the middle image uh, has actually, has won a bunch of awards. Um, you know, it, one of the things I want to say is that when I photograph my intent is to always photograph and produce an image that I can at least blow up to be 20 by 30 and kind of hold up and be clear and be good. Like for me, I don't, I don't have a lot of interest going out in capturing an image that I can't print, that I can't put on the wall somewhere. And so any image that you see here for the most part, there might be a couple that I shot at night that you'll see that are all handheld. Um, you know, for the most part, all of these could be blown up easily to 20 by 30 and, and hold up really nice, crisp and clear. So, um, but yeah, there's those. Um, so directly across from the ice house, because I met the guy who actually has been sort of, I don't know if he's the president of the executive director of the museum at the ice house. Directly across the street is uh, this little schoolhouse that's it's tiny as a little smokehouse, but it's smoke herring every year. And uh, this is the same guy that runs the ice house. And he said, hey, you should come and photograph the, the herring. And I said, sure, let's do it. And so he reached out to me, and these are the images. I came down, I had no idea what to expect. So these are the images I captured of them prepping sort of the fish and hanging the fish. They all wear, they all wear uh, you know, raincoats because like they're getting the stuff dripping all over them. Um, it's all grimy, and so it's, it, this is super fun. I love it. He just reached out to me because he, he actually saw this post that I shared that I was going to be here tonight, and he said, "FYI, we're doing the airing of the week." So I said, "Let me know." <coughs> so some more shots. I get actually inside this thing, and I smelled like whatever type of wood they were burning. Oh. Yeah, I smelled like smoke for like two days afterwards. I got in the corner and I said. Um, Trying to think, yeah, so the middle shot. So I told him to close the door while I was in there. 
And I said, but don't, you know, it's like 60 seconds is the max because the place fills with smoke. And so I had to close the door and I'm in this tiny little corner, widest lens I, I had, just trying to get the shot. But this was him loading, loading the stove and the, that's the fish hanging from the ceiling. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I mentioned sort of the Iron Man. Um, so my goal, my goal when I shoot this thing at work is to build a story. And so I just wanted to I actually put this together just today because it's like, this is a good example of sort of building a story because the, with, with any process, so with any event, there's typically, you know, you have a start, a middle, and an end. And, and I think the goal is, is that if you really want to, you know, approach documentary photography and photojournalism, you really want to show, like, you want to show that, that story in front to back. So, um, so here's, here's sort of like the story Again, 120 or so images in the final album, so this is a very small part of that. But, so, this is the start of the race. All the, all the swimmers are gathered in the corral, they're getting ready to jump into the kennebec. So you can see people are getting ready, and then down below you can see the people are still getting ready, but some people are already off swimming. you got a little kid over here yelling for his dad. Um, and then, next, you still got some people who are waiting to get in the water. You've got a bunch of people in the water swimming down the Cadillac. I get a couple close-up shots of these people swimming. Uh, and, then, and then they transition, they come out of the water and they get on the bikes. And then, they, and then I get shots of them on their bikes going back over the bridge. Um, and again, like, this is a small set, so I probably have you know, 30 or 40 cyclists. I have a bunch of swimmers, I have a bunch of you know, runners, which you'll see in a minute. And then all of a sudden they transition to a run and, uh, and, and they finish. Um, and so I get, you know, these, the guy, bottom, uh, bottom left is the winner. Um, and then these were some runner ups. That's him actually sitting down or just really right after the race. Just, I feel like my goal is to capture some emotion here to come across the finish line, but these are true, you know, hard work and happens. So, um, again, telling the story, right? So I volunteer a ton in the Augusta area. That's where my roots are. And so most of the time, when there are community events happening, I just go and it's practice for me. It's, it's like I get out there and I shoot every good that I can and practice telling my story. So every year, I, mean, I learned about this last year, every year, out at the Winds Fairgrounds, they do this like, um, it's like a trick or treat thing, but it's not trunk or treat. It's, it's sort of like, you know, people set up these little booths and stuff. And um, so I went out there this past year, and you know, this is where it gets challenging, right? So I shoot handheld 99.8% of the time. I never really use a tripod, um, very rarely. Um, and, and so really just trying to tell a story, faces in the crowd, people enjoying, people having fun, interactions, um, little kids that are happy. Uh, but I try to be creative with my shots, you know, and every once in a while I'll ask like this guy, like the werewolf guy, you know, I said, hey, can you how? And I, and I have tried to be strategic now, like, when is that what I can do? <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have any of those releases for all those people in those things? No, for the most part. So, for the most part, I'm actually talking to them, like, I'm talking to them. I mean, you'll see, you'll see some candid photos, um, sort of when I get to the New York part. But, um, but for the most part, I'm talking to them. Um, they're, I'm saying, hey, do you mind if I get a photo of you? And, and they're fine with that, and so it's in a public, it's in a public place. I'm interacting with them. I'm actually getting, a, I'm getting their, their verbal permission, um, and I'm not selling it anymore. Right? So, so none of this work is for sale. Really, all of it is for practice. And at the end of the day, I'm not selling it. But when I put an album on on social media and I promote that trick or treat event at Wednesday Fair, and like I get you know 300 people who decide to comment on it to like it. It's really promoted my business. It's really promoted my work, you know, because it shows that I can go to an event like this and capture photographs that tell a story. So somebody who might be hosting one of these events would reach out and say, hey, we want to hire you to do this. And that's kind of how it works. So it, hometown, I guess they had one of the hopeful signs show up. I said, well, when's, when's it arrived? Let me know. And so, uh, so I ran down and, and got a photo of it arriving. And uh, I just thought these were, were pretty cool, unique images. Um, I really like to 
press scenes a little bit, so I don't think the center shot. But um, I did this for my own pleasure. I, I enjoy doing this stuff. So interestingly enough, like the, the center shot, right? So this uh, PFG North Center food truck is sitting there um, parked up Wall Street. So they reach out to me and they say, hey, can we buy this image? Because it shows basically the hopeful side. It shows um, basically support coming into Augusta. Um, and it shows their branding being in that scene. So they have been buying this image from me. Um, and they use the... And so... Oh, so you know, but I've been noticing uh, this uh, event and the, uh, the smokehouse, the fishing fishing thing, and Iron Man are in color, but earlier on we were seeing black and white. So I guess sometimes you just choose to do an event in black and white. Yeah, so like like if I made this black and white, the hopeful sign isn't going to fun. It's really not going to showcase. Um, so yeah, I mean, it really depends. And for me, like, Black and white may bring a certain mood to to the event, and so I'm going to shoot it in black and white. There are certain things that I want to. This needs to be in black and white, but I'm like, yeah, it's just not going to work for some people, you know. So, you know, I, I do I do try to. I mean, my photography is not about me. It's really about making people happy. It's about creating an emotion. It's about giving back in a way. You know, Tom Tom McGee's there. You know, the caller. You know. He's tried to get somebody to come in and take over his business and run a trade, right? It's not going to happen. And so um, a family tradition that's been in his family for 100 years is, is going to end in about nine years. And so, you know, for me to be able to go in into an area, to a, to a business that's that's in the hometown of my roots and kind of go back and showcase like what he's given, like, it, you know, it fuels me, you know. And so, so then, so then with the hopeful sign, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I have fun with the hopeful sign. I got, I got rainbow behind the hopeful sign. I got, so they, they did a launch for the hopeful campaign. And it was with the, the United Way. And, uh, and this guy, so this guy is, um, he roams Augusta. He is always on the streets. He's always in his costume, um, various costumes, but he's one of the nicest guys. A lot of me never stop and talk to him, the name Jerry. And, um, and every time I see him, I fall in back, man. He loves it. You know what? It makes his day. It's my day. And so Jerry happened to be down down this event. I said, Jerry, let's get this shot right here. I said, it's going to be great. So I, I photographed I, I shot it real quick. I sent it to him. He's like, oh my God. I think it's in his profile picture. <laughs> yeah, um, all right. So probably one of, one of my um, most popular images that I've ever photographed is the one on the top left. Um, so, so I ended up down at, at uh, Fort Williams. This was just the uh, two days before Christmas. Um, we had the big boat Easter come up. I think there were 22 or 24 foot waves. And uh, and I, I had photographed a ton, um, and I was getting them packed up, and I was ready to go, and I. I look over my shoulder. Is that a boat? <laughs> and it was way, it was a ways out. And there's a boat coming in. I said, and, and I was drenched. I was like completely drenched. My gear was drenched. Uh, salt water everywhere. <laughs> and I and I was like, oh, I gotta go back. I've driven down from Augusta and this. I'm going back. And so I, I literally ran because they were coming in at a pretty good club, and I literally ran. And I got these shots of, of the boat past the ground on the way. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can see the people, the people are out on the deck, um, and, and, and um, I ended up, Ben Williamson and I were both shooting that day, and uh, 207 has come on, and they did an interview with us about this, and we actually had the captain of the boat came on 207 with us, and we did an interview, they were asking, I, I call it the ship of fools, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but, it was a little bit foolish to be out there, but they get stuck. But you'll see that at the bottom right, I mean, pretty much like that boat almost disappeared. That's a 55 foot boat, I think. It's a big, it's a big boat. Um, so you know, a lot of lens that time. You were, you said, I don't know. Farm my long lens. Yeah. Oh yeah, you were there, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You were right up by the fence. Good. Yeah. Um, and you kind of got it. I ran. <laughs> I, I didn't have a lot of time. Um, but so interestingly enough, so there's this story, right? What, what happened that day? 
And then, and then there's this story about Ben Williamson and I going back down just a week later and connecting on the day of 207, which you can see all, all of us there on the bottom right. But this is the captain of the boat uh, up at the top. This is the boat sitting at the docks in Portland. Uh, and then that's, that's Ben talking to him. And then uh, this was the crew that was on the boat down to, in the bottom center. Um, but I've got a series of probably 20 images or so that I got on the boat. The boat owner was there, so uh, I got a shot of him. But I really got shots of that crowd in the boat, so it really tells the full story about, like, sort of, um, you know, like what what this means to these people and what they're willing to do for for, for this sort of work. Um, so, um, in the winter time, I I just love like big snowflakes, and so this was um, we be flying at the VA cemetery, sort of low, usually every year, and this is uh, reach reach across America. Um, Supply the wreaths here, and I mean they're just really powerful photos. Yeah. You know, you know uh, like everybody here appreciates the, the photos as well because you know it's it's just it, it's got a lot of meaning behind it. So just we can share those. So the woodchucks down in Blue Fed, I don't know if anybody's heard of them, um, but it's a it's a group of uh, group of folks down there that basically. Um, they, they prep firewood for the community, um, and so I had heard about them, and I said, hey, can I come down? And then I went down on the mission. I shot for about an hour with them. Um, came back with uh, six, seven hundred photos, and I think it said is, I think I have probably 60 or 70 in the, in the final set, but the cool thing is, is that I'm working with, with us folks down in Blue today, and they're gonna, they're gonna build a calendar and help raise some additional funds. But you know, at the end of the day, like, I think they'll be used. Some of these portraits just are, I feel like, great. Like, top left, I just love it. The guy, the guy at the bottom of the glasses, he's actually the guy who started the woodchucks. Um, so, I feel like the, the photos have a lot of uses. So, sheep shearing, absolutely love it. Um, so, it looks a little, it looks like the animals are having a rough time, but it's, it, you know, it's, you have to be there and understand the process and kind of watch it to, I'm um, huge about, you know, ethical treatment of animals and, and uh, so I, I feel comfortable with, with this process, but um, but I love getting into this sort of thing. And honestly, like, some of the some of the images work really well in black and white and some don't. Um, you know, like the clipper in the middle, it actually looks really good in color, but I didn't want to put it in color and all the rest in black and white. Like the color and image of that just shows like it shows like the the oils and the wood that the cover is sitting on. Um, but again, it tells a story, right? The sheep are waiting in the pen. You got one sheep that's still outside saying, I'm not really cool with this. Um, <laughs> and then and then you gotta get in the you know, the shears right there, and then oh uh, yeah, here it goes. Um, and then at the end they're carting the wool, they're they're prepping the wool uh, to send off, they send it off in the uh, um, army. So So I went to Paris um, in February. I was there for Valentine's Day with my, my wife and I went. And uh, I've never been to Paris before. I've been to different parts of Europe, but uh, Paris is always on the list. Let's go to, let's go to Paris. So <clears throat> I'll show you some images from Paris. So this is the, uh, the, the left image taken from the top of the Eiffel Tower. Um, and then the image to the right was the cannon shot of uh, just the street. All my guys cat on his shoulder, and I just absolutely love that photo. <laughs> I love cats, so. Um, Arc de Triomphe, uh, Notre Dame, uh, and then just some different views. That's actually the bottom center is actually inside the Eiffel Tower, kind of looking up like that's sort of the, uh, what you call it, the, the elevator that goes up the shaft. Um, kind of like, so the inside of, of the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre. And then uh, sort of four, um, which is a Montmartre, which is a very like artistic area over in Paris, in the bottom right. Um, so then I get to the people because I love I love photographing people. Like typically, if an image doesn't have something living in it, like for me, for me, like it's kind of stale. Um, it, it, a landscape image, I love it if somebody can bring some sense of movement, right? So flowing water, things like that. But for me, I just love the human element in a photo, 
And so I try to include it. So, um, so these are just photos around Paris. Like that, the top right is, is I mentioned Montmartre. Like there's a square in Montmartre that basically all of these artists show up at and they just want to, they want to draw in these portraits. So there's a lot of the artists there. Um, same thing with Lauren Bright. Uh, and then the guy performing at the stock door, um, he was, he was literally just performing at a bunch of like, I wish the steps would have been more in view in this photo, but I was literally on my knee, photographing straight up, and I was like, I have to get really low and really wide and really close to get him and the entire building. But there were people surrounding him, singing with him. It was just a really great, great experience. Yeah, you know, I love these, and I'm wondering, is it fair to say uh, it's street photography as well? Yeah, yeah, I would say some of it's street photography. Um, yeah, I, so, so I love street photography and you'll see a little bit of, of what I show the New York stuff. Um, but, but I think that, I think it blends in a little bit more because what I, what I try to do with, when I'm, if I'm shooting street photography or shooting this stuff or I'm shooting uh, more documentary stuff, like I'm always photographing in a way that like, in my mind, I say, this has to be print worthy for me. Like, like I, I, I don't I don't just want to capture a quick photo that I can't that I can't then use. And and I'm gonna say like I don't ever do prints. The only time I ever print anything is if I enter into like a mini photography show. Like I don't do any prints, I don't really want to. I've had so many people reach out and want to buy that photo print. And I'm like, I just I don't have to I honestly don't have the time and to order from the lab and then come back and then I have to do quality control on it and it's just not my model, right? I'd rather just sell a digital file and uh, say, here, you know, here you go, it's a one-time release. Um, print it whatever size you want, you know. Um, but I always photograph with the mindset that I want this to be an image that I can blow up, that I can make big. Um, I'm editing on a 32-inch monitor at home, right? So when I get in there and, and, I, and I open an image, if that image is like super grainy, just not crisp, like it's it's gone. Um, so, so yes, it, it, street photography, documentary photography, like uh, photojournalism, I feel like they all sort of like lead and blend a little bit. But I think my approach to really just trying to create an image that I can do something with um, is is sort of like maybe a little bit of the difference. So this is down in the catacombs. So everything being done. Um, there's no light down here other than these little, little, little lights. Um, so fortunately, I, I, don't, I don't know how I got lucky enough, but like, I can handle pretty well at super, you know, like, super, super slow. So, um, so I handheld all these shots, and they came up pretty crisp. Like I can, I can zoom into that the center there. Uh, see all the edges of the bones. So these are all bones and skulls, like in the catacombs down in Paris. So these are just wanted to focus a little bit on the Eiffel Tower, just because it's such a beautiful piece of architecture, but these are just like some different shots of the Eiffel Tower. The bottom left is actually taken out at the top of Dr. Triumph, photographing towards the Eiffel Tower. Um, and I'm trying, I can't remember the name of the main street that kind of runs down the center of Paris, but um, but that's that's part of it on the left hand side there. <laughs> So this is a good friend of mine. Um, so I often reach out to him. I say often, maybe, maybe once a year, I reach out to him and just say, hey, can we do a shoot? And uh, he's super photogenic, but the top left image actually um, has, has a lot of bunch of gold words. Um, trying to I tell you what, it's stumped. <laughs> um, because the look, and, and that is not a planned shot. Like literally, that goat was, not cooperating and it jumped up on the stump and that, that was the that was the moment I captured with the dog when that shot. Um, a lot of these are not planned. I just tell them the okay, I phone with the goats. Um, the, I will say the one in the center was was sort of planned. I said, hey, go in the doorway. Um, and then the one top right, I just said, hey, what's going on? And actually, when I looked at it, he actually took his sunglasses off and as he was taking his sunglasses off, on So that's the shot I got. So this guy ended up coming to my house, replaced the carpet on my on my recently, and 
I started talking to him and I said, I said, how long have you been doing this? Because I've been I've been doing God for work. Sixty years. And I said, really? And uh, he ended up talking about me he was up in the Bangor area. I said, I get in my mind I was going crazy. I was like, I got four this guy. <laughs> and I'm like, how am I gonna ask him? Like this is really weird. <laughs> so I finally like I just kept talking to him, you didn't know a little bit. I said, Can I photograph you? <laughs> sure. So I Super quick, that was probably 30 seconds. I just said, you don't have to do anything, just sit right there. And uh, so I got a few shots of it. That. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. pretty fun. Um, so, portraits, I, I just love photographing people again. So these are just some portraits. But like most of all of these portraits, when I say when I say they're candid, I use no, I use no artificial light, right? So I typically try to find dark areas that have a little bit more. I'll use that nice natural light coming in so that I have a darker contrasty scene, darks in the back, so it really allows somebody to pop off the background. Um, so those are just some portraits. I don't know if you can sit in the center. And Peter Ralston up in the top left. Um, and yeah, so. Dave, I have a question. Of course. Um, you mentioned crisp, and I'm um, wondering. I don't. I don't mean to have you go into specific settings, but uh, what kind of what kind of settings do you use to make something crisp? And then the second part of my question is: I know you've helped me with a uh, <clears throat> an image up at Colby College, and my it was dark, and the mine came out with uh, with some light from the from the dark sky. That and uh, I just wonder if you might touch on that as well. Yeah, sure. The great thing is I feel like black and white photography is very important, right? So um, I can really, when I talk about crisp photos, I mean, I, I try to be crisp with all of my photos, but in black and white photography, like, you know, you can drop your shadows where you might have some grain, you can drop your shadows, you can increase your highlights, you can pop your whites a little yeah. bit, and all of a sudden, like, that 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 image that you thought was super grainy they actually becomes fairly, fairly clean. Um, and I, I do, I don't know how to use Photoshop, can tell you that there, there, there'll be a few fireworks photos in here that are literally just blending a few photos. And that's that's the extent of Photoshop that I know. Um, I use simple edits in Lightroom. I use no presets or anything like that because um, I want I want my images to reflect more my own personal style. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean the the crispness it's. You know, every image is different. It's hard to it's hard to like apply a standard as to like how you make a crisp photo, right? Because every every situation is, is totally different. Um, I will say the top the top right image. I mean, it was dark. It was pretty dark. Um, and and uh, this guy was photographing. Now, you know, it was cold. It was in the winter. And uh, and I, I was like, gee, I get a photo of this guy. And it was the first time. Mm-hmm. I said, can I get a photo of you? And I threw on the Sigma uh, Sigma Art. 35 to 14, and I hate shooting at 14 because I like, I feel like it's too soft. It's too much mocha for me. Um, but I put on, I put on the 35 to 14, and I got that photograph. And I just thought it worked because I actually separated myself from him a little bit, so that way the background was a little more focused than, than it would have been if I would have been on three. Yeah, it's fun. And, and, and I actually, that, that photograph has a little bit of grade, so if I wanted to do a, a 20 by 30, uh, Printed that, it would have a little bit of grain, but I actually feel like some of the images weren't okay with some grain, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that would work. A few more photos, so, um, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail. And I will tell you, like, like this one here, like this looks blurry. That's probably that, that photograph is so crisp, like, and it's because I, I actually had to email, email myself, like, I had to cut down like, the resolution and size so much. I mean, that's probably a 100 kilobyte image. Um, but like that image is so crisp that I can see the, the reflection in, in its eye and what he's, you know, what, what's actually in the sky or whatever it is. Like it's just a really super crisp image. Um, so the, like the guy with the book case I shot for an for a piece of island for it, he's an author. Um, I did a series during the pandemic because I was really all my events went away. So I did a series called From Six Feet Away, where I actually traveled to the city. 
and photograph people from six feet away because that's what that's what the whole requirement was. <clears throat> and uh, I did portraits that way, and I photographed about 135 people. And what I did is uh, pretty much told the story about like who they were, and, and uh, so shared that with with um, you know what follows me on Facebook. And and it ended up being like just a little bit wonderful project. That too was something. How about you want to tell you? I have until I have until eight. Sure, yes. I've got okay. seven twenty. So okay. right. yeah. So um some other portraits, all natural light. I'm just checking because I do I do on a very rare occasion I use uh Westcott rabbit box, which is basically um off camera flash. It's a little portable soft box that I'll bring. If I know the lighting is just gonna be terrible. So the, the flag image, um Oh, space on the name. Oh, it kills me when I do this. Is that that guy? Yeah, so he's almost cast and walks that bridge every day. He's done like four years straight, but he walks it in, in, in honor of um, some friends that actually were killed in, in a lot of what I'm doing. Um, but I ended up capturing that photo, and uh, that that photo, the boat photo, and uh, probably the two images that have been the most successful in the sense of like social media. And, and again, the strategy is you share that image on a day, you share it on, on a day when that's going to really impact people, like where it's going to be an emotional impact. Um, I always wanted to photograph the lobster lady. Um, I asked and asked and asked, and nobody ever connected me, and then I finally had an opportunity. This was, I think this was in July, maybe? Um, not in July, but. But I went down and, 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 I, and I, I didn't know what I was walking into, so I brought a little bit of gear with me. I actually brought that in the rabbit box. I don't know. And I found out she wasn't old lady. She couldn't be around very well. And so uh, I didn't want to stress her out by asking her to go over here and over here and over here. So we sat her down and we got these photos. And it just so happened this guy was coming in and had this big crate of lobsters. It's like, hey, did you mind holding a couple of lobsters? <laughs> so she did. She smiled. Made her smile. So. Um, so, um, so this, interestingly enough, um, so I, I photographed this, geez, this is probably a year and a half ago, and this is in Hollow. This place has been here for, like, many generations. It's always been, they, they do gravestones, they do monuments, they do benches, <clears throat> and, uh, super old school, I mean, the place is, like, falling apart, um, and... When I was there, the older gentleman, he, he's currently the BFB owner. Um, he's been there, for, you know, he probably started working, working there when he was 25 years old because I think he had gone into service early. Um, he was talking about how he wanted one of the gentlemen in that work had to take it over. And I just recently saw, I think it was last week, that they are actually pulled in the doors. Which is really unfortunate because it means that they you know, it ended up not happening, which is really sad because this man has so much passion in, in trying to keep that tradition alive. Um, so it's a really neat opportunity to feel like they're doing. This is, this is unique. I mean, they, they've got their own little sandblaster in there, and it's just in the center. This guy is setting up a sandblaster, and then that's him, the top right, that's him sitting at the chair, actually sandblasting the stones, and it's just really neat. Um, so this is the cobbler. Uh, so I, for that other photo, I was pretty much chunked in right about here. Um, and I'm trying to think if it was shot on the same day. I don't know, because I've been down there, I've, I've photographed Tom maybe four or five times. Um, down East actually, uh, Down East Magazine did a feature on, on the cobbler today. Uh, and, uh, and they also picked up uh, I think a series on horse logging. And down east, I picked up both of the stories. And I was just so overwhelmed with like being humbled by the fact that like those two stories were in their top 10 of, of the year um, for, for that year of being picked up on, which was just really, you know, kind of the water. It feels like, you know, kind of doing something right, I, I hope. Um, but these are really fun photos. So I had to go back down and actually photograph this. Tom's brother runs a cobbler shop in. Scout Egan, and so they wanted to do a feature on both of them, 
And so I went up and I photographed his brother Shaw, and then I photographed the two of them and his brother Shaw. So it was pretty neat because their like father was a cobbler, and then I think it was only five left in the state. It's out of the wild side just because they're animals, but uh, you know, these are a few few shots that I got um, just out and about. And, you know, I just thought they were, you know, they're some of my favorite animal shots. Mm -hmm. I went up to the Giant Sea Wild when I came back from 2,000 photos mm -hmm. of, of, of puffins that really on the water look the same, <laughs> but that, that's probably the one that I enjoy most. I actually had it on my wall in my office and I've got it blown up and say, I think that's a, maybe it's all about 30. But uh, it's super impressed, but you can see every little, every little hair. It's just, it's wild. But the thing, but you know, but the thing is only three feet away. So that's the neckline. So I went to Austria in, um, at the end of August. And um, so my wife and I, we try to do a backpacking trip every year, but literally, like, we go somewhere for two weeks. We fill our pack, and that's what we have. We don't have any luggage. We have our, our, our backpack, and that's it. So my camera here is pretty light. <laughs> uh, I, I can't take much. Um, so this is this is probably one of my favorite pictures from when we were in the mountains. We spent about ten days in the mountains, and then we transitioned down a bit into a town called Innsbruck, which is, has another long rich culture. Which was, we spent a few days there just before we headed home to relax. Um, did about a hundred and I think about hundred hundred and ten miles. Um, point to point of hiking. So these are some shots from when I was up in the mountains. So we're at about uh, anywhere between like 6,000 and 9,000 feet of elevation all the time. And so it's just crazy to think that there's this world up at that elevation of, you know, stone buildings and cows and, and you know, like there's a lot going on up there that people down at 3,000 feet never see because it's, it's in the valleys of the mountains. So when you get up and you do this hiking, like that's one of the trails and you can see the people just for some perspective in the center photo. But there's pretty crazy weather. So we actually had rainbows in the mountains. Like just, it was bizarre. Uh, I had never seen anything like it. Just like, it just, everything worked. And the wood show. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a barn. So those are, so those are they have them out, like, out west, like in Washington State. It's not they have they're, they're they're different and they, they whistle. It's, it's funny. Like, you'll see them running, and, uh, and if you stop and you whistle, they'll actually pop up and they'll look around and then they'll whistle back to you. It's, it's, it's so fun. Um, and then, you know, we've done some other trips. Like, so we, we've backpacked like in Italy, uh, Switzerland, and France, and through the Alps. And so these are just some pictures that I've captured along the way. So the, the bottom right is sort of like the hut. That's a, that's a larger hut, but we basically, we use a hut system. So they, they call them refugios. So you basically pay about 60 euros. You roll in, they have a meal for you at night. You got a bunk to sleep in. Um, they, I mean, the service isn't limited. I mean, there's no self-service or anything out there, but um, that, that little thing at the top is actually how to get your food up. So it's a cage that goes down, I don't know how many, probably two miles down, and they, they send the food up in whatever supplies they need. And then this was actually a spectacular. I, I wasn't in that hut, but I was at a different hut. And this, this sunset started to happen. It was just terrible weather that day. And we got so, and we're sitting down to eat, and all of a sudden, like, just these little bits and pieces started to light up. I ran down on my bunk and I grabbed my camera and uh, got that shot. So, Venice, um, and then the, the Italian level, right? So those, those are just kind of similar boats. I, I didn't know like the numbers. I don't know about the testing my Photoshop skills to remove some numbers from boats, but uh, I was like, yeah, probably one. I just felt like the numbers brought some sense of like, oh, there must be a resort for next door, you know. And this was Innsbruck, so this is down in the town if we get the biking. So uh, you know, again, just just some quick city shots. So um, every year at the Powell Borough Courthouse, they do a Memorial Day reenactment. And, uh, and I had seen some photos prior years, and I was like, geez, I can't make it. And there's so much going on for Memorial Day to celebrate it that, you know, uh, I get torn about wherever I go. 
And so I finally went down here. And, you know, it was just really neat. It was really neat to see, see these folks kind of reenacting and really celebrating the day. And, um, it was pretty cool. That drives out a lot because John and Neil are there. It is. And yeah, and a friend of mine. Yeah, so we're, we're, I actually just saw him at the other uh, region around me just uh, this past weekend and he was there. And he had reached out to me right before I went to Austria and said, hey, we do, we do a shoot in my life. I need some portraits. I said, I'm heading to Austria. He's like, well, I need them now. I said, well, I can <laughs> So, anyways, I saw him and was like, we're, we're going to reconnect. But um, so I photographed the Windsor Fair now. Like, so we're one of the staff photographers, uh, and, I, and I do her the donation because I just love the fair and I love the story of the Winds of Fair. Uh, it's been around for so long and it was part of my childhood. And so this is the blacksmith shop at the Winds of Fair. I didn't even know it existed until last year. And I was like, it was long because I can spend the whole week just sort of ready in the shop. But uh, so this is an image I captured uh, in the shop and I'll share it from nowhere. So these are some more images. And these are all handheld. These are all, um, you know, ISO probably 800 to 1,000 because I need I need enough ISO so that I can shoot a fast enough shutter to freeze motion. Um, but at the same time, I'm sure that I'm not getting rainy. So it's it's a balance. And not blowing up highlights in the background on the bottom, you know, on the left-hand side photo. Uh, but again, these you know the edit on these is super simple. You know, it's just basic Lightroom shadows, a little bit of you know, just my blocks, a little bit of whites, highlights, <clears throat> contrast, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, you know, I might I might adjust my sliders a little bit. Like I feel like the colors on the screen are different than the colors up here. Um, so those look a little too orange. These these look okay, but, but again, like my sliders might be a little off. I have a question. Of course. So your gear is you pre Nikon speed lights. So you not use it? I don't use any. It's a, the only time I use flash is if I'm shooting an event, like like event photography. So I shoot a lot of corporate nonprofit events. So uh, like fundraisers, things like that. If I'm indoor, I'm always I always I was flash on the ceiling or whatnot. But um, so I, I use flash a lot, but I don't use it for any other stuff. Looks to me like you have a very consistent look, and it reminds me a lot of certain kinds of old film stock, where you're very contrasting with the the, the very heavy the, the heavy blacks, and I, I just find it fascinating just how consistent your your vision is. Yeah, I, I I try I try, and you know what I mean. It's not it's not something like when I go into when I go into Lightroom and I look at my images, it's not like all right, my contrast has to be at thirty on every image, right? I go in there and it's just basically how it feels. And so it's it's refreshing and I appreciate hearing that because you know, like I think everybody wants wants to develop their own sort of style and like it's it's their brand. It's it's kind of like when you're flipping through social media and you come across the landscape photo, right? Like a lot of times I've seen that landscape photo, I'm like, I know who took that before I even see the name because they've they've created a style and and I guess that's sort of my hope, but I want to do that very often, like just by eye. You know what I mean? So thank you. The composition of the squad for me is so effective. We have, we've seen so much of the the you know the, the people with their heads and shoulders on the on the left, and you know, but almost seeming to become more engaged with their work in my mind. And then we see the detail of work over here to the right. It's a it's a great storytelling slide to me. That especially with everybody looking away from the center and waiting yeah. at each other as friends house. <laughs> yeah, I will I will so rarely, I mean it is very rare that I will have somebody who's doing something that they're passionate about look at me. And I will rarely ever actually pose anybody. Like when they're like if somebody's if somebody's creating something here, like I'm not gonna say, hey, can you move your hand this way? Like, I'm just like, do your thing. And I'm going to work around you, right? Because I want them to not even feel like I'm there. Uh, I don't want to invade their space. I want them to just enjoy what we're doing. Um, and if I can't capture it because the lighting's just not good, then you don't want to go back another day and go back when the light's better. Um, but I don't want to answer up there. Yeah. They're passionate. So uh, we'll just go through some fair photos because these are fun. Um, so that, that, that was actually 
a wildfire smoke at both years and whatnot. Mm -hmm. No photo of like the standing sediment by the first way, obviously, people want. Um, so just and for it, it's not quite so these are just some fair photos. Uh, and these are these are actually handheld, you know. Um, so I said I give I give hand handhold pretty pretty slow shutter, but the, the, the reality is these rides are pretty fast, so you can actually shoot like you know one point in a second and actually gain quite a bit of movement. Um, so these are these are pretty much the you know, the slow exposures and what you would follow the movement is, is really just handheld stuff. Um, and the, the cool thing, let me go back. So the cool thing about it, can't go back. Uh, that's fine. So uh, the cool thing about the pair of photos is that the Windsor Fair had never done anything with their website. They had never had any photos other than just people shooting their own cell phones and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Windsor Fair has been able actually totally, because, because of this, they've been able to totally re revamp their website and use the images. Uh, actually, I judged a photo contest, which is very really rewarding. Um, and uh, and it's just it's, it's just great to see that that they can benefit from sort of like what I'm passionate about. Um, and so it's like one one for everybody. So I had an opportunity uh, to photograph Lionel Richie, who performed on the booth day. Um, he got flown in, and, and this was for a big anniversary party. Uh, it's me and Lionel. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple of photos from that. But, just super fun photos. Um, trying to think if I said her image might have, I don't know if I used flash or not. I mean, it's front lit pretty well, but I think it was actually playing for the stage that was behind me um, after the show. So, um, but these are all super fun, and I, f I feel really fortunate that I've been asked and had that actually been paid to do the shoot. Because then it, it's, it's sort of like a long lifetime opportunity to kind of be from the front row, you know, from line on and, and have him. So typically his contracts say no photography. And so they said, well, we're not going to, we're not going to have you if we can't shoot photos. So they paid him pretty money to come here. And uh, so he said, that's fine, photograph away. And so this was a really cool opportunity. And again, nervous because I'm like, all right, I can't screw this up. <laughs> I did it, I mentioned this series on horse blogging. So I went up Scott Stevens is a, is a retired game warden. He was actually on Northwood's law. Um, and uh, so I, I reached out and I, and I actually first reached out to Mofka, um, who does the uh, Pomegranate Fair. And, and I said, I heard about horse blogging. I said, geez, who in the state does this? And uh, Mofka actually knew there was five people in the state that I could reach out to. So Scott was on those sort of trying to say, hey, can I come up with you for, for a morning and point back and work in the woods? And so these are some of the shots I got, which I thought was pretty cool because there aren't many people doing that. And uh, they, they do basically that a lot of people actually want um, wood harvesting and done and lots cleared this way because it's actually less invasive to the, the ground and everything. So skitters and stuff need these larger wide paths. And so when you use the horse and, and the small little buggy, like they can actually it can be a lot less invasive, so there's quite a market for it. Um, and then here's the other guy that does horse logging. I reached out to him, and he happened to get back to me too. So I went down to photograph him doing some horse logging as well. So I just wanted to share some of those images. These are some shots from New York. Um, I love going to New York. I, my goal was to get down there every year and then pay down capital and stop me from going. To get down there again within the next probably few months, and uh, I just get out for a long weekend, and I just get on the streets, and I just I just go and I walk all day, and shoot as many photos as I can, and try to capture what's going on. So these are not typically my style because I think people in them, but you probably see. Well, oh, here's the people. So mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Did you have a question? Uh, I just want to that. Uh, that white. So it's the uh, so so it's the it's the it's the, uh, it's the uh, nine eleven. They call it the Oculus, ah, and yeah. it's, a, it's a newer, newer building that's for the yeah. um, So these are just some shots around, around New York that they captured. So, uh, is it Louis Mendez? Louis Mendez, the guy in the center. So he's been photographing in New York City for seven years, seven. And he goes out every single day and he picks a spot in, in New York and he'll stand on the corner. That's an apprentice with him. 
And I told myself, there's 7 million people, 8 million people on any given day in New York City. And I was going down with a friend for the first time. I've never been to New York City before. And I said, my one goal is to see Louis. He said, it's never going to happen. Like, I've been to New York City. I've been to New York City 30 times, and I've been to see him once. Well, I've been to New York City three times in the last five years, and I've seen him every time. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so I, I had to get this photo. But the interesting thing is, is that he's showing, I don't know the exact, is it Garflex? Is that what they, they call those cameras? Like it's a speed, speed, speed graphic. graphic. Speed graphic. Yeah, speed graphic. Um, so it's an instant camera. So basically, he shoots a photo, he charges people, I think, five or ten bucks. He gives them the photo on the spot, right? But he takes one photo. So when I asked him if I could shoot his photo, he'll say, you are one chance. And I was like, I was sweating all that time. So it's like, and so I, 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 I shot the photo. I was like, oh, I see that. So, so I showed it to him. He said, you did a good job. And so he shot a photo of me. And on his phone, we actually brought, gave him his phone number. And he said, I'm going to be in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. And he said, you're all going to join me. So a so, couple of other shots. This was during an Orange third top, top right image. And obviously, we get some cold weather down in the in the bottom there. Um, I, I just, I'm going to guess that that's where it lives. So I'm going to be photographed from the capital. Um, it's just, just what I did. A um, couple of, I wanted to do a slide so the cold weather. So this shot down the wall on the left, I just love because, like, this, I was I was down photographing the scene, and I'm like, geez, this just isn't working for me. And all of a sudden, this other photographer kind of just walked into my head. Into my composition. Seriously? You're going, you're just going to walk out there when you can see me photographing here? And I was like, this works. I was like, it brings some scale to it. It, it, it shows like somebody's being resilient. They're out there and just, you know, you know, it shows that it's obviously cold, um, but it's just not falling. So I like it. But, um, so when, when we talk about sort of documentary and editorial photography, like, so this is, this is for example, uh, a small sheet that I did for, for a magazine. And so what they, they would do is they wanted to highlight this author, and, and they're only going to use a few photos. And so they say, go up and actually, we're going to give you like some free reign of, of, of what, you know, what to do, but like, these, these are sort of like the requirements. And so I went out, and they didn't say anything about our dog. Um, but, uh, so I, I started, we started photographing and she was, she was like, she was awesome. She was fun. And, um, I got the shot on the left and I was like, geez, I'm struggling to get another photograph here. And, um, and her dog, like, kept, kept like sitting on the couch and like whining. And she's like, oh yeah, I love my dog. I said, we're going to get a dog. And so they didn't make wrong with this. That's awesome. So. You know, it's like you just gotta like go with sort of what you're drawn to, like versus sometimes sticking to like that structure. Um, this is another one, virtual reality. It's like, just how can I make this look? Like, oh yeah, they, I think I think the assignment was like get a photo of get a portrait of him and get a portrait of him sitting at his computer. Work. It was like, all right, so we got a portrait of him. We get a picture of him sitting at his computer. Work, and like, what else can I do? And then I was like, wow, these virtual reality glasses, they turn me upside down and look into them, like from the other way. So uh, so I actually got that shot. And I, that's that's a tool I use. So I just, you know, it's just trying to think outside the box a little bit. I, I told you I love the state house. So some shots, different shots in the state house. Um, I love the top left shot. It's the first time that the fireworks. Um, this is an area in Augusta called Allen Hill. Um, it's kind of a newer area. like. Not new, it's all been there, obviously. But uh, but the, the the land trust has created a trail system up there, and so you can access it easily. And so this was the first time that the fireworks would line up with the capital. And I had I had strategized it on my mind, like I think this is gonna work. So I went up there and I photographed it. It's like the only time that it would line up this way because they don't often watch watch fireworks from that location because that they just so happen to be doing it later. <clears throat> Interesting enough, when I was up there, I was getting attacked by a forest. So, yeah, I was like this loud, really loud screech. 
I was like, what is that? And I, and I shine my flashlight behind me and there's a fox sitting there. I'm like, yeah, it's <laughs> And again, fireworks, like that's the only time I use Photoshop. And I use Photoshop literally just for blood and multiple images. So I use a tripod here. Um, and I just blend multiple, multiple images so that I can uh, overlap some of the fireworks. But you have to be strategic about it. You gotta make sure that like, you know, you have one up here, one here, one here, one here. You're gonna blend the images because you're blending it. Images that have them all in the center, it's not going to look too good. So, so I like this one. Like this, this one isn't blended very really well. There's too many in one area. So these are probably like six images collapsed into one for each of these. And Dave? Yeah. Um, do you use the bulb setting for fireworks? Yes. No. No. Uh, no. Uh, fireworks. Fireworks typically like, you know. You know, I, I usually shoot fireworks pretty much wide open. So mm -hmm. at two at two point eight, like one eighth of a second, um, ISO sixty four, uh, and and that just works. It's it's kind of fireworks are kind of easy just because like they, they don't launch fireworks during the daytime, so your settings are always kind of the same um, for the most part. So the recent storm we just had, uh, this was what. Maybe three, three, four weeks ago ish. So I didn't know where to go. Um, Southern Maine actually really didn't get the storm too much. Uh, and I went up there, I guess. So I thought, oh, I'll go to the Big Coast. And they closed the rain water. As you can see, people didn't care. <laughs> um, so I, I, I posted these photos out and I got a little brief back. Like, people like, oh, you know, there's a lot of comments, you know, bashing all these people. And I get it. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't go out on the breaker, break water other than to stand at the very and then ready to get for that shot. But I thought they were interesting because, you know, we are, you know, able to start getting somebody off. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked, <coughs> I asked them what I should talk about. And, you know, one of the, one of the responses I got was like, you know, who inspires you? Like, who's one of them? Um, John Logan's actually photographed, I don't know if everybody knows him, but he, he just came up with a book um, of all of his work, but he's photographed plot only like, to me still photographing, but like back into the 70s. And his work is very much sort of more, like, like mine in style, but he is really good. Um, but he didn't realize he was good. You know, he, it was, it's kind of emotional for me, to be honest with you, because I, the book was coming out. John really didn't have any exposure to any of his work. The book was getting ready to come out. So Island Book Press reached out to me and said, hey, we need you to do a portrait with John because we're going to be watching this book. And uh, so I met John down, down in Portland in the old port. Um, I had just had eye surgery. I was not in a good place because I just was going through a rough time. Um, Health-wise at the moment, this was like a couple of years ago. And uh, I show up, I just wasn't feeling it. I had, I had to wear glasses and I, it just was not in a good place. It was my first time meeting John and, and we sat down for a little bit and then I started photographing him and then we started talking. And he, he actually, you know, he started talking to me a little bit about how people used to make fun of him and, uh, you know, growing up and he you know, was, like, was kind of bullied. And, and I said, John, I said, your work is beautiful. Get it out there, like, you know, celebrate it. And, um, and so, unbelievable. His book came out, and he he has presented. And if you have a chance to have John come up and speak, have John come up and speak. Like his work is phenomenal. Um, but like I'm super inspired by him because like he's self-taught, trial and error. But like the guy is a, is an amazing person, and his style is just it's just awesome. So does he do really you know, good Yes, so yeah, I mean, I would, I would probably put it into the sort of the classification of my, my style. So, um, so the, John and I went to the fair. Like the, the one on the right is actually one of the portraits I shot for the book. But um, and I was just down in the old floor at 70 to 200. Uh, so I just said, hey, John, just, just lean up against this. He, he has this, he has this like obsession with his camera. Where like he'll be sitting there. I mean, if he, if he ever came and spoke here, he'd have his camera right here, and he'd be taking photos while he's talking, right? <laughs> and so, so I said, John, just go over there and, and lean next to the, lean against the wall. 
And he leans against the wall and he starts looking at this camera. John, you have to look at me. You gotta look over that way. You gotta, you know, and, and it actually turned a lot of fun. So, but, but these are, this, this is actually, uh, they did a, a big release of the book and this was a presentation he did. So those are sort of some of his images that are being shown up here on the, on the slide, so. So again, client list. Um, hmm. Love this image. Uh, this actually has won some awards and titled it just walking around. Um, and this is, I literally was in a barn and the light is nice and I love the shadows. I wish you could see a little more detail on the chicken rather than the works. Yeah, I know. I know. I thought all the time. Totally wrong. I thought it was like the something to do with the sheep, but for me, my I didn't go to the sheep enough. Um, and and so I, I had to go back with like focusing on the chickens. Great. Yeah, very, very. yeah, so this is a recent this is a recent shot here. Um, you know, we get a lot of inversion in Augusta, um, where basically they kind of like river down like just different temperature variances. <clears throat> so I'm going to the gym every morning and it kills me around here every morning because I know that the light's just going to be beautiful in this fog. And, and then I get to the gym, which is at a high elevation, and I'm all of a sudden out of the fog. And I'm like, okay, there's a version going on. <laughs> so this is from Howard Hill. This is um, this is the, the same same pretty much advantage that I shot fireworks photo from. But uh, yeah, this goes to the full cool inversion. And like, you can zoom in, and I'm going to actually go right in. See the light, the light bulb on the top of the. Uh, uh, is that that Gaston Woods or something? Yeah, it's up in Gaston. However, it's it's so you go up through Gaston back. Right, so it's it, it can't be flying for us. Right, right. So it's always accident successful. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's a great trail there. You can also access it in Hall at Stevens Common. Yep. Up behind there. There's two advantages. There's one advantage that will give you a perspective of the camera. Uh, and those are helpless, obviously. Uh, I shot that standing on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's actually it. The last slide. <laughs> To the question, when you in your flight of backpacking with me in Europe, yeah. you can't have your whole thing with you. What do you use? The, the uh, Peak Design Capture System, which basically mounts to my shoulder strap. That's a big camera to have mounted here. It works. You know, it can happen because there's a lock on the lens, which, which helps. But I also bought a Sony A6300. Um, which uh, I'm trying to think of the lens. 18, um, 18 to maybe 18. I don't really know what it is. Um, I think it's a 24 to 200. I think is what it is. It's not a fast time. The Sony one? Yeah. 24 to 100. No. Could, the 6300 is a crop sensor. It is. It is. Yeah. is that the new for the crop sensor? What's that? Is, I'm not familiar with the right is there yeah. any issue with crop sensors? No. It's the only crop sensor camera I, I know we have. Um, so I, I got back for this trip. Um, we got a great deal on it. It had two lenses, like a fairly wide and it's a crop sensor, so like you know, like you know, an 18 would be like 18, you know. So um, but I I like the camera, but I noticed the quality difference. It, and I'm gonna be getting to that, right? So I'm starting to shoot, I have that thing hanging in here. And, uh, it just wasn't, colors, I hate Nikon colors, hate them. I, I, I just can't stand the colors of, of, an, of an Nikon where I love the crispness of the photos. So I'm thinking, I can be okay with the, trying to correct the colors a little bit because I like the crispness of the photos. I like, I, like, I feel like the noise is, Works for me, like the, it's low, lower noise, um, but it's a big camera, you know. So it's uh, so I, I think probably what I'm gonna do is is basically the best in any Nikon mirrorless camera. Um, that's just gonna be for for backpacking, and I'm probably gonna get Nikon has a, the new 24 to 200. Um, so I'm probably gonna do something like a Z5. 
um, with the 24 to with the 24 to 200. And I'm probably about, you know, buy it from Nikon with Furbish to really get a deal on it. Yeah. And, and I'll just yeah. use that camera and, and Sony for for that and just to just stay back. Because if you just have a rucksack, you don't want to have a giant camera and a huge lens. You want something really small. Yeah. My, my, my pack was 46 pounds. Uh -huh. um, and and the camera gear, I was finding my wife said, she's like, just wear your camera gear. So we were actually at the airport and she asked the people we were checking our backpacks in. She's like, just bring your camera and stuff all day. It was like it was like 10, 10 pounds of the camera gear that I had. So I, I had, um, I had like, the, like I said, the Nikon with the 20 to 300, which is a big lens. And then I had the, the Sony. Um, that's, that's what I had at that time. <laughs> do you, uh, how much or do you at all rely on your portfolio? Uh, um, You know, I, honestly, sometimes what I'll do is if I'm if I'm in a more of a candid situation, uh, unplanned. I know I have that in my in my car. I might hop out of the car and say, "Is this going to work?" And so I'll pull my I'll pull my phone out and I'll actually compose something real quick to see is it is it really worth me getting that camera out? <clears throat> Beyond that, really, all of the images. Are Pretty much. I mean, when I'm backpacking, I'll use it a little bit, but um, but for the most for the most part, like everything that's on my phone for images are actually high res images that I've emailed to myself, <laughs> so that I can post that you know post social media. It's it's not a not a great process. <laughs> I, I wish I, I wish I could figure them out. We're doing well. Yeah, trying. Um, and it, and the one thing I want to say is that like, you know, I, uh, you know, my stuff, my stuff is it's it's not perfect, and, and I, you know, I get my inspiration from everybody, right? So, and, and I want and I want to give back. I have a lot of people reach out and say, hey, can I go shoot your Sure. Like, it's not a competition to me. You know, it's it's really camaraderie, and um, the people who have kind of helped me along the way. I'm very appreciative, and, and I always just want to pass that, that knowledge on. And uh, you know, every time you launch something, like you learn something from them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and for me, like it's you know, it's just the camaraderie that's most important. So if anybody wants to have a little photograph into this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, certainly let me know. One of the things that that uh, the feedback I got was, you know, we could talk about some of the year, uh, the projects you've been working on. And I, I don't really have any. Anything that's super pressing, you just know that the stuff that you've seen, a lot of this happens in the year. And so, like, I'm, I'm honestly wanting to constantly go back and do better and, and, and find a different perspective. And, like, I'm going to go back to the ice harvest, I'm going to go back and photograph the hair, and I'm going to go back because I, <clears throat> every time I see my images, they, they, they get better each time I shoot. And so, like, I just want to keep improving, like, different perspective. like. And so if anybody ever wants to involved in the photograph, reach out, you know, like I'm, I'm happy to share, share that experience. And, you know, like I actually, on the way up here, I saw a rainbow coming out. We just found out the best thing you had in the wrong I sent a message to uh, a good friend of mine who does landscape guitar and mm -hmm. doesn't really understand sort of like weather too much. There was no rainbow yet. And I said, there's going to be a rainbow in the mm -hmm. yeah. And like, I just, you know, it's, it's really, it's really about kind of lifting everybody up together. You know, um, that's how we all shine together, right? <laughs>